This video is meant to give you a little setup on the period known as the critical period, which is the period right after we won independence uh, to when we drafted the U.S. Constitution, which we still have to today in 1787, 1788, 89. So uh, to give you a little background, tomorrow we're going to be talking about uh, specifically Shays' Rebellion took place during the critical period. But I want to give you a little context to prepare you for that discussion tomorrow. So the critical period, we just get uh, independence. We win the war. It's 1783. Um, we have a whole bunch of changes happening. We have uh, many states are lowering, not completely getting rid of, but lowering property requirements to vote, expanding democracy in that in that way. We have separation of church and state getting established in a lot of uh, colony, uh, colonies in more states now. And we have um, the discussion about the role of women and the idea of Republican motherhood, which we'll dive into deeper with our projects. We have many states drafting their own state constitutions, which become eventual influences to the, the constitution that we eventually adopt later on. Massachusetts uh, becomes um, the model for that later on. Our first national government, just to keep in mind, right, is the Second Continental Congress. We talked about this. It happens right after Lexington and Concord, and it is a unitary government. It's one branch. It's just a group of people, and they are essentially the national government. What comes out of the Continental Congress is the Articles of Confederation. This is, a, for all intents and purposes, our second national government. It's drafted. The Articles are drafted in 1777. This is in the middle of the Revolutionary War. It's a confederate government, basically meaning it's a group of states that agree to come together as a confederation uh, and, and to work together. But it's very, very loosely, compared to what we think of today in our national government, it's very loosely connected, confederate form of government. Now, this, the Articles of Confederation is a daunting task. It's the new government. It's essentially the Congress, uh, representatives from all the states. And they're shown here in this cartoon as being in the same boat, and they have a rocky rapids to rocky road ahead of them they you know will the will they smash upon the rocks if they get past the rocks it looks like they could potentially just fall into the abyss of anarchy so this was a really tricky time period so let's take a look at what the articles did and didn't do what some of the weaknesses were of them and then talk about uh a few key events so let's keep in mind the articles of confederation most historians agree are weak they were meant to be weak they were designed to be weak on purpose the writers of the Articles of Confederation disliked taxation without representation. So under the Articles of Confederation, the federal government could not tax. <clears throat> they disliked a large central government that had absolute power. This is what they feared about Britain. So states didn't have to follow federal laws or treaties. Each state could do what it wanted to. They did not like having to follow British legislation. So states had their own laws, and they didn't have to follow the other states' laws or federal government's laws. They did not like the fact that there was a lot of power in the king's hands. So as a result, there was no executive branch. There was just physically no president, no king, no, no branch of government that was an executive branch. And there was no court system. Uh, very, very weak government. They did not like the fact that the king could change laws at any time. So any amendment to the Articles of Confederation, any change to the Articles of Confederation, had to have all 13 states agree to change it. And very hard to do that, uh, near impossible. What else were some weaknesses? The federal government could not tax. Therefore, it was really difficult to raise money. And one of the big things they had to raise money for is they owed a lot of money to individual people who they borrowed money from during the war to pay uh, for the Revolutionary War. They borrowed money from foreign countries. They had to pay this back. They couldn't do this because they couldn't raise taxes. They, they Basically, they would say, here, we think that Massachusetts, you owe this much. Georgia, you owe this much. Could you please pay up? There was no powers to force people to pay taxes. States didn't have to follow laws and treaties. And therefore, the federal government had no assurance that individual states would follow any of the policies they wanted to. Each state had its own laws, and it was very difficult to take any kind of united action. And this made it particularly tricky on commerce. You had some states that would put tariffs on trade from other states. It's the equivalent of Massachusetts putting on a tariff on New York. So if you went over to New York and imported something to Massachusetts, you'd have to pay a tax on it. This makes for a very tricky way to grow an economy. And so it was very, very, very difficult. It was weak on purpose, though. If you look at a lot of people today, they want states' rights versus this federal government's rights. When Obama was the president, a lot of the Republican-ish red states wanted more states' rights. And now that Trump is the president, we want more power to states' attorneys general and to weaken the, um, the federal government. What was the problem? Since there was no executive branch, the government could not defend its borders. And we're going to see that's an issue. 
Since there's no executive branch or national court system, the government couldn't enforce his laws. Any amendment required all 13 states' approval, so it was very difficult to change or modify, even if they came up with problems, because there's always going to be one or two people that have a problem. And what are some of these problems? Well, they had some big problems, particularly foreign problems. We're going to look at two problems, foreign problems and domestic. Foreign problems, one, the Navigation Acts. If you remember, uh, the Navigation Acts are, they said that you, British colonies can only trade with British colonies and for the British Isles. And now that we're not part of the British system, we're actually left out of this. And the picture here is Lord Sheffield uh, of the, the British Treasury uh, uh, Ministry. And he he says, look, it, let him come crawling to us. We, we wanted him to negotiate uh, some sort of trade or commerce de treaty that would kind of go around the navigation. Actually, he said, no, nah, that's, you know, they were bitter. They were bitter that we, you know, betrayed them and stabbed them in the back. Um, another the reality is, despite the fact that the Treaty of Paris said the British were supposed to withdraw from the troops, if you look at the map here, these British held forts were still occupied uh, by British troops long after they were supposed to leave. Their argument was that, hey, we, you know, we, we're here to protect the loyalists that you guys are harming, which there was a lot of harm against loyalists. Um, we, we we had not paid up what we owed to many loyalists. Many loyalists lost their land. Their land was taken over and confiscated by the new states. And we did not, we were supposed to compensate them. We didn't yet. So they said, until you do that, we're not pulling out of our forts. This will remain an issue for a while. Um, and then the day of Algiers, who was this chief of this North African kingdom, uh, who controls around the Mediterranean, uh, these guys are taking American sailors, a lot of New England shippers and sailors, uh, they're taking them hostage and kidnapping them and making them slaves, and there wasn't anything we could do about it. So we have a lot of problems with foreigners, and there's not much we can do about it. We can't act any united way, we can't raise an army, we can't tax to raise the army, to pay for the army. So these are unresolved issues. There were some important achievements so that we should, we should highlight. So if you look at the, the yellow area on the map there, there is the Northwest Territory. And... The Articles of Confederation government passes the Land Ordinance of 1785, which basically splices us up into parcels, and they pass the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. These are new territories, they're not states. So what do you do with these new territories? So if you stop and think for a second, why create a pathway to statehood? This is what the Northwest Ordinance does. It says, look it, you move out there, eventually some of this territory can become a uh, state. It creates a pathway to statehood on equal par with Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, anything. Uh, why do this? Why not just use them as colonies? You can use them as sources of wealth, and, and we're a new nation. We need to get on their feet. Why don't we just use this area to enrich itself? Um, and, and if you stop and think about it, right, what might happen if this territory was given colonial status? The Confederation, in creating a pathway to statehood, solves a problem that England wasn't able to. If we were, if there was a way that we could have been as colonies incorporated into the English system on a more equal footing, we might not have had the revolution. They were not able to do this. So the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 creates a pathway to statehood, which solves this problem of revolution and creates the way that states become states throughout the rest of the uh, next couple of years. Then we get to Shays Rebellion. This is a domestic issue and breaks out in Western Massachusetts, out in our own neighborhood. Um, you can find your own town on that map, see if it was around, around there. This is from 17, uh, <clears throat> 1786, I think, map. Uh, but what, what happens is a bunch of farmers in western Massachusetts rise up and they take over some courthouses and they, they start out in actually Great Barrington and they move east towards Springfield and eventually somewhere between Springfield and Worcester they get kind of captured and suppressed. But what was this all about? The issues at hand were uh, farmers in, in western Mass were in huge debt. They were unable to pay their uh, taxes and also their rent and their, their farms were taken. They were calling, many of these farmers were calling for paper money, to print more money so they can have access to money because if they're in debt and there's more money in circulation, it's easier for them to pay off debt. Of course, creditors, people who lend money don't like this because the value of their, their loans are weakened and they don't, their, their, their money is not worth it much. Um, and these, a lot of farmers couldn't vote because the property requirements to vote were too high. So those are the underlying issues. Now, these guys wanted lower taxes so they could be, you know, make their payments and afford to live. They wanted paper money so there was more money in circulation. This is an issue that will constantly be at play throughout the next 100 years or so in, uh, in American history. Now, why were the taxes so high? And this is crucial to understand, understanding the rebellion. The states were in the process of consolidating and reissuing their banknotes, these basically IOUs. During the revolution, Congress was printing money left and right to try to pay uh, revolutionary soldiers and to buy weapons and supplies. But there's all these different kind of notes out there. 
And depending on the time and the year, these notes were worth lots of money or the value of them would go down. So the states were trying to consolidate all these notes and, and reissue these kind of one kind of note at a certain value. And Massachusetts was debating to uh, what value do we redeem these notes? And in other words, if you have uh, on these, these notes, we want, to, we want to take them and collect them so we can consolidate and reissue one kind of note. But they, they, you know, people who would bring the notes to the, the banks or the state would then get money in return for this. So they were debating, do we redeem them at the higher value they were when they were originally issued? Or like right now, they're not worth too much. Um, what should we do? And so they decide that as a state, our state house votes to redeem them at the highest value. So you bring them here, we'll give you the highest value they were worth. Uh, and that's a good deal. So if you have these notes, that's a great idea. Uh, and a lot of revolutionary soldiers, these veterans, these farmers had these notes so they could go and they would be able to pay them high and get more money from them because they would be worth more. They would be redeemed at the higher value. But where do they get the money to pay this? Well, they're from taxes. Well, there was a land tax and a poll tax. And in order to vote, you had to pay a tax and then to own land, you had to pay tax on that land. So this is where the money comes from. Everyone who has land, they would pay taxes and some of this tax money could go to people who had these notes. But by the time the Revolutionary War is over, the people who had these notes were wealthy speculators. There were speculators who were buying up these notes when they were worth nothing. They said, hey, you're desperate for money, I'll give you some money. And a lot of poor veterans who didn't have much money sold their notes, they gave the notes to these speculators. Most of these speculators were in Eastern Massachusetts and Boston, and many of them were actually state legislatures. So these guys voted to redeem these notes at a higher value, and they were the ones that had most of the notes. So they stood to make a lot of money. And again, you're taxing people, all the people, to pay notes, to pay for these notes that are going to the wealthy. So it's basically the wealthy taking from the poor, or at least that's how Daniel Shays and his followers felt it. So they rose up. Now the rebellion was actually put down by a militia that was paid for by the Eastern elites. The federal government, there was no federal armed forces that could put down a rebellion. And so the wealthy in Boston got to, together, raised some money from each other, and paid a militia to go and crush Shays' rebellion. So this is in the same spirit as Bacon's rebellion, as in the Paxton Boys, as the regulator movement, this is West Western state, you know, in, in more internal frontier type people, more of your level, you know, lower level class people rising up against Eastern elites. Now it's during the Articles of Confederation and now it's a rebellion, not against the British, but it's against people in the Eastern part of the state. It's eventually crushed. The common story you see in many textbooks is that the founding fathers saw Shays Rebellion and realized the articles were too weak. We needed a more powerful central government to suppress these kind of popular uprisings and prevent anarchy. George Washington, after Shays' Rebellion, we have errors to correct. We probably had too good of an opinion of human nature in forming our confederation. Experience has taught us that men will not adopt measures for their own good with the intervention, without the intervention of a coercive power. What a triumph for our enemies to find that we are incapable of governing ourselves. So they're worried that there'd be all these internal uprisings and we needed a more coercive or forceful power. Tomorrow in class, we're going to explore the question, did all Americans think that the articles were too weak? Were there some that were happy with the way it was? And how did Americans react to Shays' rebellion? Clearly, George Washington is alarmed by this. It's going to be anarchy. Um, tomorrow, we're going to see what did people besides George Washington think about uh, Shays' rebellion. Um, but nonetheless, to many people, it was a weakness of the articles in, during the critical period. So I'd like you to review the video and imagine you are in favor of fixing the Articles of Confederation. I'd like you to argue in favor of changing the original articles. So in your post, be sure to acknowledge the specific weaknesses of the articles, naming at least two weaknesses that you think are critical, uh, while at the same time acknowledging those original fears that the people who made the articles uh, were concerned about. All right, so make that post and we'll talk about it tomorrow.